we could go, uh, you know, in, into that line of thinking, a, a p- potentially a, an injury that a baseballer would experience frequently. And let's mm-hmm. talk about rehabilitation versus prehab versus preparing adequately, uh, adequately for the sport. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, so let's start at probably the most common age of what we would call little league shoulder or little league elbow. Um, now obviously baseball is much larger um, in the U S than it is in most other countries. However, um, this involves obviously, um, the, the functional sporting act of pitching, which is a very similar, but also very different act to a cricket bowl, um, cricket bowling, the arm, the elbow is straight. So all the rotation comes from the shoulder. Whereas in baseball, the shoulder um, and the elbow are both bent. So you get rotation at the elbow, which can cause problems at the elbow and the shoulder. So those are the two most common, what we call little league shoulder, little league elbow. For the longest time, right, um, you know, at 10 or 11 years old was when children at, at, at these youth athletes got introduced to live arm pitching, right? Um, and just to tee this up a little bit, the mound is also declined. Right. So you're standing on a hill, falling down off of a hill to increase the momentum or the velocity so that the ball goes faster to the plate. So you, you have all these variables that are the, the primary goal is to throw it harder. End of story. Right. Like if it's accurate, great. That's even better. But at 10, 11, 12 years old, if you can throw it hard, you just I mean, just mow the other team down. There, you, you have a 10 year old kid that that is just overpowered. And so what you end up with is a mismatch because you have the, 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 the probably the most athletic child out there who's going to be your pitcher because he's the most dominant position on the field. Um, by the way, he's your game winner. So he, he or she, right, but, but again, softball is an underhand movement. And so um, that's a different arm action that's much safer for the arm. So this is primarily for baseball, uh, but some females actually play baseball um, through nine, 10, 11, 12 year olds. So he or she pitching, um, is going to be called upon to pitch a lot because they're going to win games. Um, and so this creates this very dangerous expectation of, uh, little Johnny or little Susie is dominant. So they're going to pitch often. They're also throwing the hardest. Um, and they're usually going to play another valuable position on the field, whether it be shortstop or center field or catcher, in which case they're going to participate in throws. And the reason I bring this up is because when we talk about little league shoulder or little league elbow, there's three general variables. And this gets into your question about how to rehab this. There's three general variables that go into um, why these youth athletes break down. Why do they hurt? One is frequency. So how often they throw and the volume at which they throw. So throwing 80 pitches and doing so every couple of days because, again, they're 10 years old. uh, They're invincible. They're a bunch of stem cells. They're just, you know, like they can go forever. It's like a rubber band. It just goes and goes and goes until it doesn't, right? And so these kids specialize. So they play year-round. They throw a lot and they throw often. So that is variable number one which we'll talk about how to manage. Variable number two is ball velocity. So it turns out the harder you throw, the more force you create, the more force has got to come from somewhere that typically goes through your shoulder or your um, your elbow. So again, another tick against good, good athletes because they're the ones throwing the hardest. They create the most force. Um, and then number three is general conditioning, body awareness, proprioception, you know, what we can call this control, we can call this strength. I mean, there's a lot of different terms. And so that's the, that's the really the one that that's the toughest because a general strength and conditioning, um, program, uh, is greatly enhancing to this player's longevity. However, there's a bit of demonization that comes with strength and conditioning in youth sports. So those are kind of the three strikes, and it's ironic that we're going to say strikes because it's in baseball. So there's the three strikes that are that are somewhat against you. Now there may be a few more, but those are the biggest. And so when I have an athlete that comes in and says, you know, they they usually had arm pain, they didn't tell anybody because coaches expected them to play. So this went on for a few weeks, really got bad. Saw their you know their pediatrician, saw their sports med um, physician, and he said or she said. 
hey, by the way, this is not good, right? We did some scans. Like your growth plate is seeing a lot of stress. This could be long term, you know, consequential if you don't do something. And so, parent, usually mom and dad and child come into my clinic and, you know, and they're all sitting there saying, we're really worried about what this means. But, you know, Johnny's got like all star, um, all star team coming up. They got travel ball two weeks after that. They got, you know, fall baseball. They got, and it's like, all right. So let's just, let's stop for a second and let's, let's think about where this goes long term. And this is a conversation with the parents. And I usually lay these things out. I hand them some kind of collateral and say, listen, these are the three variables. One of those variables, the frequency, the volume, there's no amount of exercise, there's no amount of fancy prehab work that we can do that's going to change that you have got to take ownership of this because this is not just something that i can say we'll rest for a month and then you go right back into it and you'll be fine it's not going to be fine okay Uh, what what type of education are you providing uh, further afield than just you've got to reduce the amount that you're doing or the frequency because this is this is widely applicable to Sports mm-hmm. in New Zealand, uh, water polo's arms, obviously cricketers, yeah. lower backs, um, knees, ankles of netballers, uh, footballers, and but it's the hardest problem to solve yeah. is you need to do less than what you're currently doing. Uh, I mean, we've we've got some recommendations yeah. now. You know, don't train more than the, the number of eight years that you've lived. Um, try and get some a bit of balance between free play or unstructured exercise and structured, you know, two to one structured to unstructured. But so are these the types of things that you're talking to your families? They are. They they are. I mean, some of it has been um, manufactured from little league sports where there's pitch counts, right? Where you can only throw X number of pitches or you have to take certain amount of days off. Mm -hmm. The problem, right, is we have to remember that doing things, um, there's something called the Cobra effect. These are unintended consequences of what is a seemingly uh, morally good intention. We're going to supply a pitch count. It's going to be very rigid, right? You, you throw 78 or, or 80 pitches. That means you can't throw for four days. It's very res- restrictive, but again, comes with consequences. So that means that little Johnny is throwing every four or five days regardless. And they're throwing 79 pitches, not 80, 79 and then he gets pulled it doesn't even matter if it's in the middle of a hitter like which is kind of uncouth <laughs> you, literally 78 79 he comes out and then they put him back at a position um you know back on the field where you're making more throws and so typically parents have never reflected on that because because they're they're typically on board there's enough research out there to say throwing injuries are frequency driven so they'll say, yeah, coach has got us on a pitch count. And I say, great. How many pitches did, did Johnny throw? And they say, oh, he threw 69. Great. Um, did you count the warm-up throws before every inning? And they're like, well, no, those don't count. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, what about the warm-up throws before the game? Did we count those? Well, no, 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 those aren't pitches. Oh, okay. Um, what position does Johnny play um, outside of pitcher? Oh, he plays Third base. Okay. Well, they take kind of a a casual in and out in between innings, right? Where you roll a few balls, you throw them across. Did did we count those throws? Well, no. Oh, okay. So there's another 40 to 50 throws that Johnny made that we just seemingly washed away because they weren't actually on the mound competing. These are simple things. And this is what I tell, um, same thing with other athletes. Like, Oh, my back hurts when I run or uh, water polo. Like I'm doing these things and they're typically underestimating the stress. That's the problem is because they're only counting the ones that they feel are game sport driven. As in the pitch count is only when I'm pitching. That's really more or less not true. It's throws as well. And throws don't just happen when you're on the mound. Water polo, you're not just throwing it when you're in the game. Um, you know, it, cricketers, like swinging a bat also puts stress on your back, not just bowling. And so I think for most people, if you can give it to them and say, hey, we're talking about um, 
a tolerance thing, right? You're, uh, I, I'm sure you've probably used or heard the cup analogy before. Uh, maybe your listeners have heard that, right? You, you're a tissue or your body is is resilient to the to the capacity of a cup. When you pour enough water in the cup, the cup's happy, does fine. When you pour too much water, it overflows, and that overflow is represented as discomfort, pain, performance, degradation, whatever. So that's where I try to live is explaining to parents, um, I know you understand frequency is, is an issue, but do you understand where – who all is pouring water in your child's cup? Yeah, I, I love the analogy because it's so so applicable here. And you're talking about watching the amount of water that's going in the cup and, and trying hard to estimate when it's about to overflow, which is incredibly difficult, uh, particularly Incredible. when – particularly when the problem only arises when, when the arm is way too sore to throw, which mm-hmm. is, is well beyond the point of too much stress, right? And so, right. so you're talking about monitoring the water going in, uh, thinking about the holes in the cup that might be mm-hmm. letting water out, and that's creating wear and tear. But, but you're also talking about developing a bit of bigger cup, aren't you? No, so that gets into a really good a really good point about point number three about the management of the entire system. You can make the cup bigger. Your arm will get stronger and more tolerant, like any structure in your entire body. Our our I mean the human body is exceptionally adaptive. If you put enough stimulus consistent that doesn't become catastrophic or catabolic, like you just destroy something, um, otherwise it's gonna adapt over time. And so um, pitching uh, is one of those things where you can build up the tolerance of an individual's arm, fine, but it's very slow. It's not going to happen in a season, and and this is not going to happen. This is like the concept of of with runners, and they say, uh, I don't understand why my Achilles or why my gastroc or my, my calves are weak. I run all the time, and I say, you're right. Your calves are very good about doing submaximal stress very repetitively that does not make your calves bigger it's not a the stimulant the response of your body is not going to make something larger until you overload it in kind of a heavy strength and conditioning atmosphere throwing is repetitive um it'll make your it, it'll 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 improve the endurance of your arm but it's not going to make your muscles physiologically bigger larger that's what we want we want bigger and the only way to do that is strength training. Um, but again, that means that we got to take part of our pizza pie, right? We got to take a sliver out and say, you're not going to th- play baseball. You're not going to throw on this day. Instead, we're going to strength train. And that's a very hard, you know, that's a very hard thing to get somebody to buy into uh, because skill sports feel like the only way to get better at the skill is to do the skill. Particularly at those younger ages. Yeah. But that, that's, a, that's a real thing that, and you mentioned earlier there's some skepticism around strength training for adolescents. I, mean, I think that, at least in, in the research now, and it's becoming more widely sure. known, it's, it's a myth that, that's been busted. <laughs> you know, we're not going to injure the athlete no. or stunt their growth by, uh, by lifting Absolutely some weights. Um, assuming it's done in, in the proper environment. Uh, of course. I mean, anything in moderation, right? I mean, there, there are parameters to all things. You drink enough chocolate milk, it'll it's bad for you. Right. I mean, like drinking off water, it's bad for you. So I, th- th- that's a, that, that, that's true for all things, but you're right. I mean, there's enough evidence to say that strength training and youth sports is by far and above acceptable. And so let's jump back to, you know, sitting in your clinic when you're having that conversation and number one, you're talking to the parents and the athlete about doing less, uh, because less stress is where we need to start. Otherwise it's mm-hmm. nothing's going to change. Right. Uh, it, what is the journey that you're taking them on after that conversation? Where, where are you trying to take or get to? What are the things that you think are important to right. deliver well, on? The, 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 the benefit of these athletes um, coming in is because uh, is primarily due to their velocity going down. They can't, they're not as overpowering, so they're incentivized to do less. The, the, the doctor right uh, in the U.S. that's more referral-based – has already told them that this is bad. So they're generally coming in saying, I know that this is going to involve rest. Um, and they're not throwing as hard and it hurts the throw. So they're generally accepting of, yeah, this is time to do something about. Uh, 
Um, so that is easier for me. But what really wins them over is when I say, hey, actually, we're not going to totally shut it down. And they're like, oh, I thought this was like two months of me not touching a baseball or not even doing anything with my arm. I, I, the parents are looking at me like, oh, no, you know, the doctor said that we were just going to come in and kind of get some stretches and just kind of, you know, that, that's it. We're not going to do much else. And I say, oh, no, on the contrary, we're going to do a lot. We have two months to build up every other kind of base of support. We can, because we know that when your core breaks down in a throwing motion, it puts more stress on your arm. When your stance leg, right, as in your big sturdy base that transfers force from the ground, falling off the mound, driving the ball down, when those things are weak, it puts more stress on your arm and elbow. When your, um, when the back of your shoulder is not strong, slowing your arm down as it comes forward, that can cause a myriad of shoulder and elbow problems. So you're right. We don't have to do anything to make Johnny throw better with his arm or throwing. We can do everything away from his arm, in in the back, in his back, in his legs, in his core, and we're actually going to improve his throwing velocity, improve his accuracy, and his durability. And all the while, he's not going to throw for the next six to eight weeks. And all of a sudden, the parents are like, oh, wait, wait, no, like, I'm, I like this. This sounds not, and Johnny's like, oh, cool. So I get to still, I thought I was going to be like a turtle for the next, you know, eight weeks. And then I really light this candle when I say, great, can you hit? And Johnny's like, yeah, I'm probably one of the best hitters on the team. Of course you are, because the athlete that's the most dominant pitcher are typically the most dominant athlete because they're just the most coordinated at this age. Great. You can still hit. Seriously? Yeah, absolutely. The The amount of force on the elbow and shoulder during hitting is markedly lower than it is during throwing. So I'm off. I'm, I'm great with that. You can DH. You can pinch hit. Um, obviously, other than that, you're, you're pretty much shut down. After four to six weeks, guess what? I'm going to do you one even better. I'm going to let you play first base. You're going to underhand the ball back to the pitcher. And they look at me like, seriously? I had no idea I was going to be able to play this fast. So I think, again, like we talked about in the beginning, common ground, being sympathetic. Like Johnny doesn't want to sit on the bench and watch his team play for the next three months. I get that. I've been there. I, I get it. So if we can provide a very logical, very algorithmic approach to this, that gives something back. Yeah, we're going to do some some stuff to work on throwing and your leg muscles and we're going to get your coordination. We're going to work on those things. We're also going to strengthen your arm up. We're also going to let you still play. You can still hit. You can still do these things. And it's typically, um, you know, when we get through that conversation, it's like, oh, this was so much better than I was expecting because I was expecting a series of no, 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 and no. I love it. I, I want to get into the weeds a little bit on a couple of those things that you mentioned because I, I think it's helpful, uh, particularly around the process that someone needs to go through in order to build the body back up or, or even just to provide some some stability or, or some function that once upon a time they, they probably had. Uh, so you talked about the, the importance of the, the stance leg or the lower body mm-hmm. and, and how that needs to provide that stable and strong basis support so i'd love for you to expand a little bit more on that and then the other one you mentioned was the the core and the integration of the core Mm -hmm. and i think that's there's a a lot of jargon or a lot of you know misbeliefs around what the core actually does and and that just a few sit-ups is going to solve this problem so (laughs) yeah so can you can you jump into those two areas a little bit for me yeah, so I, I tend to look at it like a math problem, right? Like uh, it, it's it's physics, but it's it's a math problem. So the the focus, right? If you can imagine um, your big strong legs, and I said stance leg, but honestly, it's both legs because one leg, if you can imagine in your head a right-handed thrower, they're gonna lift their left leg up, they're gonna lean to their left, and they're gonna drive. That means they're gonna push their right leg into the ground. Right, so they're generating kind of this coiling force to drive themselves forward, which is creating velocity, which is going to improve the ball speed. Then they rigidly plant a semi or pseudo rigid on their left leg, which creates a pivot point. And so when that left leg lands, it drives into the ground, it puts all that force and stops it and lets it rotate through their hip and through their core 
basically spinning that force through the arm into the ball and you create the linear velocity, right? So it's an angular rotation that ends up with linear velocity. The ball goes straight to the catcher and you get a lot of speed. And so what that means for when I explain this to parents is this starts with your child's legs. The action does not start with the arm. Johnny is not standing there flat footed and just throwing the ball to the plate. There's there's kind of this dance that happens, right, where the, he rocks backwards, loads up his leg, squats, drives, posts his leg down firmly so that it's a it's a sturdy point of rotation. And then the rest of his body yanks himself through and puts force to the arm. So if by that analogy, if we strengthen up the leg, we create force. We also improve the efficiency of that force. It's the same concept. Uh, I, I explain it to parents using um, uh, a slingshot. And I say, I want you to imagine if I handed you a slingshot. Okay. So you're holding this post. You have the tubing. You put a rock in it. You pull the tubing back and it fires the rock. Perfect. Now, this time I hand you the same slingshot, same tubing, same rock, but the stick is very flexible. It's very bendy. So when you pull on the tubing, it bends the post. And then the rock kind of goes everywhere. And the, and the parent's like, oh, so you want like a stable base of support. I'm like, absolutely. It's exactly what we want. We want stability of the, lower le- of the lower legs. We want power and stability because that gives us a very solid way to transfer force from the ground, through the legs, through the core, which is the next component, through the arm, through the ball, a.k.a. dominant pitching. So after they get that, they're like, okay, I get it. And I'm like, so now the legs and the core need to work together. So we talked about getting your legs stronger. Now we need to get this magic thing called your core stronger. And they say, oh, yeah, like your abs. And I say, kind of. Your abs are part of this picture. But to your point, we have this misnomer that um, the, the core consists of ripped washboard abs. <laughs> and that's – Obviously not true. Um, Your core is made up. It's a barrel, right? You have muscles on the back, muscles on the sides, muscles in the front. It creates a chamber that um, kind of can can expand and contract. And it essentially is – it's a bit of a paradox because it does two very opposite things. It produces motion and then it restricts motion. So it has so doing a plank, doing um, a bridge, doing side planks, doing farmer carries, doing right where you're holding weight by your side, fantastic. That 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 answers one of the bells, the stability bell. It prevents rotation or prevents movement. But we also need to do things, um, things called chops and lifts and rotations, not just doing like the the Russian twist where you sit and and swivel side to side. But doing things where you're throwing things in a rotational capacity across your body because those muscles need to rotate as well. And so it's this very dynamic, very fluid, very, um, very concert um, concept of your legs being stable at some points where your core is being the rotator at other points and then vice versa where your leg is being stationary and then your core picks up and rotates, right? So what I'll explain to him is the easiest way to think about this is when Johnny starts his motion, his core is tight so that all the force is going through his legs into the ground, into the body. When he, when he, and when he you know, lifts his left leg up and then he starts moving toward the ground, rigid core, legs driving, when he lands on his left leg, his, la- his leg stops moving, becomes very rigid. Then his core becomes very dynamic and rotates so that his arm doesn't have to do all of that by itself. And all I explain this is now we've transferred force from the ground to the legs, through the core, into the chest, through the arm, and through the ball. As opposed to no legs, no core, arm like a bullwhip. And bad things happen when you use your arm that way. It, it transfers all the force from the ground into the hand and the ball, which creates a very long lever and puts a lot of stress on the elbow and the shoulder. And then usually parents are like, oh, so that's why 
we don't want him kind of letting his arm fall and throw sidearm and kind of, you know, all over the place and loosey goosey and kind of flapping his arm around. And I say, it's exactly right. It is exactly right. So we have to address those things. Um, and typically I start going down the route of control, strength and stabilization well before I go into pitching mechanics in a 10 or 11 year old, because we have to be careful, um, in my opinion anyway, um, that we don't stifle innovation and innovation in the concept of exploration of this child. They're going to figure out the most efficient way to throw a baseball. Right now, they're, they're answering that based on the available answers they have in front of them. They're not strong. They don't know what's supposed to happen. They're overthrowing, so their arm's a little sore, so weird kind of things are happening. So they just make a, a decision. Well, I'm going to throw like this because it doesn't hurt as much, um, and the ball kind of goes where it needs to go. I think that is. I think that's the that's the dilemma that we all have, right? We we look in from the outside and say, well, he's he's pitching. Look, Johnny is pitching. It's working. He's getting the ball from the hand through to the catcher and and therefore it must be okay it's not until they experience a, an injury or, or they start getting really right. sore that all of a sudden we need to we need to provide some sort of support uh and so i think that's that's the struggle that we have is and you know what why do we need to do all of this work for an 11 12 13 year old kid who just wants to go out there and throw a ball uh yeah i mean it's a great it's a great point and and honestly I would agree with some of that sentiment that, you know, to, to be honest, um, they just want to play and I can, I can jive with that. I mean, I just wanted to play. Um, so I think for me, I disguise, uh, although they don't, I mean, I'm getting what I want as in getting them some strength and conditioning Th- that for me, that does two things. It keeps them from playing at the time because they can't be playing and in the gym at the same time. Um, and then it gets them stronger. So for them, it removes some of the frequency. For me, it's solving some of the inadequacy. But but the answer is exactly right. Uh, or the answer to your question is just as difficult. And it's exactly what we were talking about. Is it's difficult to say. Is the reason that Johnny hurt, hurt his shoulder because of the way that he throws, because of the weakness, or because of the volume at which Johnny was throwing? Uh, you're right. I have no idea because there's plenty of. Johnny's out there that have terrible throwing mechanics and don't have arm or shoulder pain. And you could argue maybe they don't throw hard enough. Maybe they don't throw often enough that it, that it, you know, it, it peaks that threshold. It, it runs the water over that cup. And so for me, I don't have a magic equation that I can type this into. When Johnny comes in, I don't put in column A, column B, and column C. I say we're going to manage all of them at the same time. Because they all probably have some positive impact on y- you as a person. Oh, by the way, you can't throw for the next six to eight weeks anyway because you're destroying part of your growth plate. So might as well do this anyway. Yeah, this is the thing, isn't it? And it's just such a hard question to answer. Uh. How much is too much? But but I think what we do know is the, ske- the current scheduling in youth sports is ridiculous. Uh, the yeah. at, at that point in their growth and their maturation, they you know hu- the human form is just not supposed to be doing that much of one particular thing. Um, yeah. And so we're we're really fighting. I mean the the age of strength and conditioning, the area of uh, you know supporting kids around strength training has had to evolve because we're up against a schedule that is so demanding. It's just breaking kids down. Uh, but but it's a, it's a matrix, isn't it? It's it's we've sure. got to, we've got to take something away, we've got to add something in, and and move them in a direction of of being better and, and right. you know for what they're trying to do. Well, I mean the the problem right is, is the first thing that any um, any popular uh, successful high profile athlete will tell you is what well, you know how'd you get here um I mean, how did you make it to the to the big leagues and those they're all going to say the same thing i worked really hard and i spent countless hours at the field taking extra you know extra swings and taking extra ground balls and and it's like yeah i, I, I don't want to 
by any means discourage commitment and work ethic. However, um, that is unlikely to be the reason that Aaron Judge became the most, you know, one of the most popular baseball players in the U.S. He's seven feet tall. You know what I mean? Like he's like six six, two fifty. I mean, he's a massive human. He wasn't spending extra time growing at the baseball baseball park, right? Like there was a certain element of that that made him successful. And and to say that all those extra ground balls don't help, no, no, no. On the I I do think that they help, but in the grand scheme of things, I don't think taking extra throws. You know, and forcing children or youth a- uh, athletes to play more, be there all the time. I mean, this is a, a huge problem in CrossFit right now, where th- some of these youth athletes are breaking down because it's not the it's it's not like we said earlier. It's not the running, it's the volume of the running, right? It's it's the intensity of the running. It's it's throwing is not inherently bad, but if you do it year round, then yeah, it is. But that's, you know, the Absol- dilemma. Yeah, absolutely. I think what has changed is the choice. Uh, you know, a, a decade or two ago, kids were able to decide uh, themselves, you know, much more than they do these mm-hmm. days of how much they're doing and, and when they're going to rest. Uh, and, and now the, the pressure to, to perform, to be in teams, to make the next team has just escalated and hence they're, they're doing a whole bunch more. Uh, so, that's right, yeah, and it, and you, and you and you can't and and the problem right is is you can't be the athlete that says I, I didn't do enough right like I, I I didn't I didn't spend enough extra time I didn't get enough extra lesson that's why I didn't make it realistically that's not why you know you didn't make it um, but you know that's that that's hard to to internalize like i'm just going to do less to do more i don't know that i i I can't do that you know i think this has been really useful chris and and i'd like to just finish it up by asking you for some advice and like if you could pitch this towards parents coaches people you know the adults in the room that are uh, talking and working with young people but then that haven't necessarily reached the point of being broken or having an injury what, what do you what would you say to those people well, the, the the phrase that I commonly use is, um, and I ask parents, how many? Um, so little league baseball is massive, right? The little league World Series is worldwide every year. Uh, maybe not this year because of the, uh, the 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 coronavirus, but it's televised. It's super popular, and I ask them, what percentage do you think? Um, just guess what percentage of athletes that play in the little league World Series or play in the little league championships make it to to major league baseball? And they're usually like, oh, it's probably pretty high. These are some of the best. You still hear me? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, it's exceptionally low. And they look at me and they say, really? I said, exceptionally low, like point zero zero something percent, I believe. And they look at me like, wow, really? I said, yeah, the reason a lot of them are burnt out by the time that they get, Right. And playing something, being a sports specialized athlete, is a recipe for disaster. We know this to be true. And I say, so for the sake of the durability, for the psychological well-being and happiness, and for the enjoyment of the sport, it behooves you to just appreciate that you don't need to be playing every weekend. Spend two or three months a year away from baseball. That means picking up one less league. I'm not saying that they don't need to go to the the, the camps to get seen, to go to the coaching clinics. That's fine. I'm not unrealistic to think that you're not going to do some of that anyway. But just one less less league, right? If they're going to play travel ball, then drop one of the others. If they're going to play sports year round, which I'm all for, then then try try to make them where taxes different systems right if you're gonna be a baseball player then maybe think about track if you're gonna be a baseball player try soccer football right anything else to prevent overarm action and you will be amazed at how happy and generally 
pain free that they will be when you give that that option. But if you let this become the norm, then three years down the road, you're not going to have a choice because the expectation for you, for your child will be we got to do this. This is the only way to, to go beyond that. And so um, I try I try to explain that. And I, and I say there's a reason that baseball players, when the season's over, I've worked with a lot of them, major league baseball players. Ask them how many throw a baseball for a few weeks. Zero. Most of them are like, <laughs> done, not doing anything. I'm going to take a few weeks, uh, a few months off if I can, depending on the season, and then I'll get back into it. That has to be the narrative. And it's it's tough. It, I mean, it's it's very difficult because of the social mantra that more is always better. 